Have you ever worked really hard towards a goal and then you complete it? And once you complete it, you're actually more depressed than you were excited? We're gonna talk about that in today's episode. So a researcher and professor at Harvard coined the term arrival fallacy. And what it essentially describes is exactly what you and I have been through. We set a really big goal. We work really hard to achieve that goal. We get to that goal. We achieve it. And afterwards, it's like all downhill. So like I mentioned earlier in this episode, this is what's called a rival fallacy. And I'm going to read some notes that I took after reading a couple of different articles that I think really hit this home. And, and these authors put it better than I could. So I'm just going to borrow what they said. So typically speaking, when it comes to a rival fallacy, the person that experiences this the hardest is a person that starts a journey or starts a goal in a state of unhappiness. So for fitness, you're somebody who is unhappy with either the way you feel or unhappy with unhappy with the way you look, or you just don't feel good, period. You're just in a place where you would feel much better if you started some sort of fitness journey. And so you're unhappy to begin with. And then you reach a goal that you set for yourself, or maybe your trainer or somebody who's working with you sets for yourself, and you hit that goal, and you're actually met with sadness, not happiness. And so you're sort of left in this weird area where like, I worked really hard for this, but I feel depressed. Why is that going on? I really like the way one author put it. He said, it's like being on a hamster wheel that keeps spinning faster and faster the more we run. Yet despite all the effort we exert, we feel stuck in place so that the phenomenon of a rival fallacy eventually sparks an existential crisis. As we sort through these feelings, we question our sense of self, decisions, and worth. It pretty much has the exact opposite effect of what you might think. And I think part of this is due to the fact that we set a scene that our behavior is going to achieve if we do certain things in a certain way. And when that scene that we had in our mind this entire time doesn't match reality, that's when a lot of the depression or, you know, sadness sets in. It's sort of this dopamine rush as we get to our goal. And then once we achieve it, that dopamine is just like cut off. And for those that don't know much about dopamine, I'm no expert on it. But what I have studied basically tells me that dopamine is the doer chemical. So it helps you do things. It's not the euphoria chemical that you get when you achieve things, when you've gotten to the end of the road. And so dopamine is building and building. And every time you get a, a small achievement towards your bigger goal, that dopamine kicks off again and it kicks off again. And every time you get closer and closer, it keeps kicking off. It's sort of the anticipation chemical. I like to think about it. So again, what happens when you get there and how can we prevent this? Because as you can imagine, this isn't something you want to keep experiencing. So there's ways that we can reframe how we approach this so that we can still set really good goals. We can set ambitious goals. We can set reasonable and smart goals, but we don't get this feeling afterwards because I'm certainly not here to tell you that you shouldn't set goals. I think that's a bad idea, but how we approach them from a mindset standpoint makes a huge difference on what we experience when we actually achieve the goal that we set out to achieve. So how do we prevent a rival fallacy? The answer is more simple than I'm probably going to lead on, but it essentially goes like this. Too many times people focus on the outcome, what they want to achieve. And there's nothing wrong with imagining the outcome, but you can pretty much guarantee that the outcome is never going to match your imagination's interpretation of what the outcome should be. So while knowing the outcome is useful, reminding yourself and focusing on it is actually harmful. It's one of those things where, yes, I know where I want to go, but you need to focus on what you're currently doing to get there and making sure that you have milestones along the way to your outcome goal that you can continually hit and achieve something afterwards. So nine times out of 10, the issue is not that you're setting goals. It's that you're anticipating and expecting it to be a certain way when you get there. In the case of somebody who is setting a goal because they are unhappy and they want to achieve something and feel better about themselves, oftentimes what ends up happening is they don't feel any happier once they've achieved it. And when you look back at all the things that they had achieved along the way, 
and you ask people to think about that time, almost all the time, somebody is saying, it was the little things during the journey that made me feel good. When I got to the end of the rope, when I achieved my goal, I didn't feel that anymore. So it's about actually focusing on the journey, focusing on the process. You've probably heard the term fall in love with the process. I'm not a big fan of cliches, but I think that one is actually pretty good. And I think it's a good piece of advice to have in general, whether it's a fitness goal, a life goal, a financial goal, it doesn't matter. Falling in love with the process makes a big difference. Just to throw some of my own personal light on this, one of the things that I've realized by not setting any goals for getting back into fitness is that I'm actually enjoying it because I'm not constantly focused on how many pounds do I need to lose or how much weight do I need to push on my bench press or, or the opposite, focusing on the fact that I'm not as strong as I used to be. There's all these things that can kind of get in the way of our path, but if we focus and our intent is always to show up and be as present as we possibly can and enjoy the process as it happens, that is how you get longevity in health, in relationships, in financial you know, savings and status and, and being financially comfortable. There's many pieces that go into that and all of these. But my point is, is that if you want to look back on your life and you want to have fond memories, I can almost guarantee that those fond memories are going to come from the journey, not necessarily achieving. Now, you might have a list of achievements of things you've done in your life, and you can feel proud of that, but the emotional connection to those achievements won't be as great as the journey along the way moments that you have. And so if you're somebody who either likes to set goals or doesn't like to set goals, here's some advice that I would give you. And this is based on personal experience as well as working with clients. The very first thing that I would do is if you're just getting started and you often get intimidated by goals and the fear of not being able to achieve them, I would set your goals as things that you can achieve and feel good about almost instantaneously. So if you set a goal of going to the gym three days a week, that's something that every week you can achieve. There's not this huge you know, timeline that you have to work through. It's something that you can achieve on a weekly uh, basis. The other thing is what is good, and I don't necessarily follow this myself because I haven't found that it works best for me, but you could set daily goals. And those daily goals could be very small kind of micro wins where if you do this every day, if you wake up and show up at the gym, that's a goal. Uh, that you can achieve. That's a an outcome goal. If your goal is to you know eat a certain amount of protein every day, that's something you can achieve daily. And then you can look at the week, and then you can even look at the month. Personally speaking, just being as transparent as I can with you, I'm not a big goal setter. I'm mostly I have an idea of what I want to do, and then I just go do it. And that's because for me, I've noticed that if I put goals down on paper, I oftentimes get intimidated by failing those goals, and I get so preoccupied with the anxiety of not meeting those goals that I actually reduce my ability to take action on those. But if I have a general idea of what I want to do and I have a very small list of things that I want to achieve, I almost always hit those uh, incremental milestones as well as the big outcome goals. So that's just for me. And if you're somebody who's in a similar boat, that's what I would recommend. If you're the kind of person that like has a a hierarchy chart on your wall and they have all your goals on it, you probably don't even need what I'm saying in this episode. But my point is, is that if you get intimidated by goals, if you get anxious about the fact that you might not meet those goals that might be too ambiguous for you, I totally get that. That's one thing that I would recommend is to really break down your goals into things that you're almost already automatically doing. I'm a big proponent of identifying the things that you're already achieving so that you can get some sort of contrast against your mind that might be always just highlighting the negatives. I know for me, my brain will always be more attracted to what I'm not accomplishing than what I have or that I am accomplishing, whether that's in my career or in my fitness goals. That's just how my brain works. And I think based on some research that most human brains are very interested in the negative and and less interested in the positive, and you sort of have to train yourself. But my point with all of this is, is If you've experienced a rival fallacy where you achieve a big goal and you're like depressed at the end of it, I highly recommend documenting or 
making a point to highlight the little wins along the way. So let's just end with a really classic example. Let's say that you want to lose 40 pounds and it's January right now and you want to lose 40 pounds by October, let's say, or even before December, like you want to make it like a holiday weight loss goal. And so your big goal is to lose 40 pounds. But what if we broke that into monthly goals? So I'm not going to do the math in my head because I'm terrible at that. But let's say that between January and December, that's like 11 and a half months. It's almost February. So let's just say it's 10 months. In 10 months, if you want to lose 40 pounds, divide 40 by 10 and make that a monthly goal. How many pounds could you lose per month? And maybe even more accurately, are you able to actually do that? Is that a realistic goal? Maybe we'll do an episode in the future about realistic fat loss expectations per month. Um, Not a big fan of going down that rabbit hole again, but for the sake of this example, let's say that that's a a reasonable and ideal goal. And so then that could be one way of doing it. Um, And then you could have even more micro goals than that. So maybe every week, let's take fat loss out of the equation because I think monitoring fat loss per month is probably the lowest you want to go. If you're doing it per week and you're not super hardcore or like doing it for a show or something, I think a monthly check-in for fat loss is, is a good plan. So let's do something else. Let's do, let's divide it into fitness and nutrition. Let's say while you're losing 40 pounds of fat, you also want to improve your squat or your deadlift or any sort of lift. And you can work with a coach and say, these, these are the goals that I want to achieve. How do we break these down into small pieces so that every week I can see progress? Maybe the progress for you in a squat is you were able to do a hundred pound squat for six reps and the next week or the next two weeks, you're able to do seven. You might think, well, what's one more rep? Well, if you look at it over the span of a, a long period of time, which I hope that you would want to do with your fitness, another rep at the same weight increases the amount of weight that you're lifting, increases the amount of volume that you're lifting, and only goes to improve your muscle mass, your strength, all the things that are going to benefit you by continuing along your path. So never discount small wins. Never look at one more rep or five more pounds on the bar as too small of a goal. Those all are very important. The reason why we typically don't consider those big goals is because we're always focusing on the outcome goal, which is only going to lead us to a rival fallacy, you know, the phenomenon that we're talking about today. So It's not that you shouldn't have big outcome goals. It's that when you set them, you should forget them. Write them down, put them in an envelope, mail it to yourself in six, eight months, whatever your timeline is, or give them to somebody else, or put it in a lockbox, whatever you got to do. But the point is, is that once you set those goals, it's not enough to just say, that's my goal. You have to measure the progress along the way. I believe it was episode one or two when we talked about the fact that you can very easily lose sight of what it is you need to prioritize in the moment when all you do is focus on the big goals. Big goals are great. You want to have these to some extent. You want to have some sort of goal that you're always climbing towards, but don't forget the small things along the way because they're really what propel you. And at least in my own personal fitness journeys and the stories that I've gathered from clients that I've coached, more times than not, there are negative thoughts that keep people from actually continuing on to achieve the goals, whether it's a slight setback or a very popular one is when your weight fluctuates and you're trying to lose 40 pounds and you you go up two pounds in a week and you're thinking, holy crap, I'm going backwards. Why am I even doing this? I'm putting all this work in and all I'm doing is gaining weight. I'm going to give up. I need to start a new plan. I need to try different things. There's all these reasons why that might be happening to you. And if you don't combat those with constantly focusing on the most present goal in front of you or even just showing up to the gym, it can be very hard to continue. And again, it's one of the reasons why gyms in February are almost vacant because people work really hard in January. They don't get the results they're expecting. And we'll possibly talk about realistic expectations for goals in the future. And so then they quit. And it's not necessarily an illogical way of thinking about it. When you're going through something in life and you're trying to achieve something, you want to see steady progress along the way. It might not be linear, but you want to see steady progress. And the biggest thing that trips people up is when they take two steps back and one step forward, they feel like they're not moving anywhere. And in that moment, that might be true. 
But when you look across a long timeline of when you started to where you are now, you will consistently see taking two steps backwards and one step forward. And then the next time around, you take one step forward, no steps backwards. So it's this constant fluctuation. And as long as the trend in the and the pattern is going down in a certain direction, if we're talking about you know weight loss, as long as the pattern continually goes down, you got nothing to worry about. You're going to have highs, you're going to have lows. It's just like life, right? Very rarely does anything in life look like a straight line from start to finish. Almost always it's periods of ebbs and flows of valleys and mountains and, and success and then complete failure and start again and you know go back and forth. And fitness is a great example of that. And that's one of the reasons why I created this podcast is to help you navigate when those things in life happen. Because if there's one thing that's inevitable about your fitness journey or self-improvement in general, it's that there's going to be times where you completely fail and you think, oh man, I got to start all over. And really the answer every single time is no, just keep going because this is to be expected. We have to get it out of our heads that success from start to finish is always a positive. There's always positive jumps along the road. And that if you hit a roadblock or you hit a negative or anything like that, or you move backwards, that you should start all over again. Nothing could be further from the truth. The more we get comfortable with understanding that failure is a part of a success process, that without the failure, there's lots of things we don't learn, but also understanding that in order to succeed, we have to fail. There's no way around it. There's no like everyone succeeds all the time. It just doesn't happen. So the more comfortable you can get with failing, I mean, it's going to sting, it's going to hurt, but the quicker you can move on from that and realize it from a logical standpoint that this is part of the process and all I got to do is keep moving forward, the easier time you'll have not only with self-improvement, but with sticking to a fitness goal past February. All right. Thanks again for watching today's episode. I believe this is episode number five. Um, If you ever have any questions that you want me to address on the podcast, if there's anything that you would like for me to talk about, maybe there's a subject that you just, you, you want more information about and you'd like to see it on the podcast, don't forget to hit me up on Instagram at Shane Hubbard Fit. And I don't believe you can message me on YouTube, but make sure you check out the YouTube podcast as well if you want to see the video version. As always, thanks a ton for listening, and I will see you in the next episode. 